Welcome to episode 8 of The Meshup. My name is Kelly Senecal, and you may be surprised that I'm the host of this episode. Normally, Tiffany Cook hosts the show, and she's been doing an awesome job. And she'll be back for season 2, but as this is the last episode of the first season, we wanted to mix things up a little bit and have a conversation between two of the founders of Convergent Science, myself and Keith Richards. So Keith, welcome to the show. Thanks. Happy to be here. So you're a co-founder of Convergent Science and one of the original authors of Converge, and you're still heavily involved in the development. So in this episode, we're going to talk about how to get from a blank screen and an idea to a fully developed CFD software. Okay, and for those of you who are wondering, this is actually the Keith, Keith Richards, uh, not the other one that maybe you've heard of. So we're thrilled to have you on the show, Keith. Thanks again for coming. And let's start at the beginning. So you were using CFD in grad school. What was your experience with it and what were the pain points? So all of us founders were students at the University of Wisconsin at the Engine Research Center, and we used Kiva and Many engine CFD users out there may be familiar with Kiva. It's kind of the, the original engine-capable CFD code that was developed at Los Alamos in the 80s. And this was the late 90s when we were at the university using it. And when you talk about pain points, I think some of those pain points just were associated with the fact that it was already an outdated code even in the 90s. So we were dealing with a lot of complexity in the mesh generation. We were very limited into the geometries that we could create. Uh, and if you were trying to do a complicated geometry, uh, you may have months making a grid uh, just to get a, an engine simulation to run. So it was actually pretty amazing what it could do though. I mean, it being written in the eighties, it was extremely fast. It was originally developed for highly vectorized systems uh, like Cray computers. Uh, what that meant, though, is that vectorized code was sometimes very hard to read. Anybody that's seen Kiva, uh, you know, the joke was CC Flux. Nobody touches CC Flux. Yeah. That's, Do not go into CC Flux. Just leave it alone. <laughs> yeah, uh, O'Rourke and Amson being the original authors there, they did that, and we just left that part alone. Uh, and as students, we would deal with the periphery. Uh, we'd write uh, submodels, but rarely did we touch the guts of the code because it was actually very complex uh, in the way it was written for a vectorized system like the like the Cray system. So I would say pain points would be ease of use on the user side from running the code, but also ease of use as a developer, uh, just because the code in its vectorized form in Fortran 77 wasn't really developer friendly either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember you and I made um, made a mesh together, the Caterpillar mesh for the Caterpillar engine. And a uh, I think that took us, did that take us like two weeks to make? And we had maybe some of the best tools available to make a Kiva grid at the time. We, did, we were even developing some of our own just to make it right. work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You wrote something that did, uh, was it 2D grid.f? 2D grid.f. <laughs> good old Fortran. Did, yeah, that did the in-cylinder part. And I worked on an early version of G-Smooth for doing the ports. And that's that's what we used to make that. And it was, it was Actually, I think it was probably more than two weeks because of the code development we were doing. But Correct, on, the, yeah. on the scale of, of making Kiva grids, that actually wasn't bad. Yeah, that was actually, and I think that grid, I mean, as of a few years ago, it was still being used. I don't know if it's still used today or not, but every once in a while you see it pop up in a publication here and there. So yeah, so that, good times. Um, so <clears throat> back in graduate school, you know, we decided to start a CFD consulting company, which was actually the precursor of Convergent Science, in, in essence. So let's talk a little bit about why did we start the company, and also, why were you personally interested in co-founding the company? Well, you know, early on uh, in my life, my, my dad uh, was self-employed, and he pushed my brother and I to, to try and run our own business when we were teenagers. So... Uh, there's a little bit of an entrepreneurial spirit that you get. Uh, mm -hmm. We we mowed lawns, and I, I think a, you know a lot of teenagers mow lawns. Uh, by the second year we did it, we had two trucks. Uh, we mowed 80 lawns per week. We had five mowers and hired several employees and had a, a full-blown operation going mowing lawns. And you, you kind of catch the spirit that here's how I can maximize my return on my investment, my investment being the effort I put in. Right. And when, when you start a business, you get to see the fruits of your labor, and it's more directly correlated. So 
I, I would say I always kind of had the thought that at some someday I'd like to start a business. And one of the nice things we had at the Engine Research Center, and you you know this, Kelly, is you, yeah. you interact with industry a lot. Mm-hmm. You, you you make those connections. You're able to develop a reputation for yourself even while you're a student. And and those connections are what allow you to do you know start a, a consulting business. So I, I would say that was kind of the what I. I had always seen myself starting a business at some point. I, I didn't know that it would be that soon, but I had always seen that being the case. Yeah. So, and you actually had, even back then mowing, you were doing some parallel processing, right? You had five mowers going at any given time. We, we did. We did. Yeah, we... <laughs> <laughs> sort of foreshadowing of the future there a little bit. And I agree. I mean, one thing, you know, we both had the same advisor in grad school. And one thing that he was great about was letting us go and present at meetings and letting us go and present at conferences instead of him doing it all the time. And it really did allow us to kind of get our names out there and, and start to develop a reputation, even graduate school. So that, that was very helpful. Like you said. Yeah. Rolf and Chris, Rolf, for those uh, that don't know Rolf Rates and, and Chris Rutland, who are the advisors of, of the, of the founders at the Engine Research Center were actually very good that way. When we would go to conferences, you would see professors preventing, presenting their students' research. And, and Rolf didn't do that. The students got to present their research and got to be the face of their research. And that, you know, that's, I, I think, a, a great way to do it. Uh, obviously, I, I feel that way because Rolf was my advisor and was good to us that way. Yeah. But I really, I really appreciated that. I did too, although I have to admit, my first presentation back in 1996 at SAE was a fuels and lube show. I was scared to death. And I was like, what am I even doing here? <laughs> Rolf, why aren't you presenting this? No, no, it worked out really well. And, and I agree. That was a big advantage for us. Um, so after, so we started the business and then, you know, we, we were doing consulting, making Kiva grids, for example, like you said, uh, the code that you wrote called G smooth was a big part of that. Um, but after a while we decided to write a new code from scratch. So can you tell the audience a bit about the motivation behind that decision. Why did we do that? Well, when we went into business to do Kiva Consulting, just about every engine re- uh, engine company out there had a research group that was using Kiva. And so sort of our plan with doing consulting was we would take the knowledge that we learned about Kiva and our expertise in Kiva, and we could then do consulting for these research groups at, at the various different engine companies. Well, you know, that worked to a point. Um, what we ended up kind of becoming, though, was a grid generation consulting company. I mean, we, we did help them implement submodels. That was part of it. But a lot of what they needed was just help making grids. Uh, most of them were doing sector grids. They weren't doing full engine grids. Uh, or if they were doing full engine grids, they would run an intake simulation in some other commercial package like Star CD, map the results, and do in-cylinder only in Kiva. So we became a Kiva grid generation consulting company, which anybody who's made grids understands that it it was a necessity, but you weren't really being a productive engineer. You were just making a grid. You weren't producing results, analyzing results. You were just setting up a case to run. And so it it became painfully obvious to us that that the future of engine CFD was going to be an ease of use. We, We had to simplify the the, right. the setup process for for making grids and that was sort of what drove us to to want to write our own code you know kiva had the ability uh for for the users to modify it themselves and add their own models and that was that was something that research groups were not going to give up but it didn't have the ease of use star cd fluent some of the other commercial codes were further up the spectrum on the ease of use capability but they weren't there either I mean, even in Star, it would take weeks to make a grid, and, and, and that was becoming unacceptable. You know, you could use that when CFD was new. People could say, yeah, so it takes a couple of weeks to make a grid. Uh, the future wasn't there. And right. so that, that was that, that's what we saw. And we said, okay, clearly there needs to be something out there that's better. And, in fact, maybe you could talk about, Kelly, the fact that we originally were going to write an open source replacement code for Kiva. You know, we tried getting funding to write an open source code. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And so we were trying to almost directly replace Kiva back in those days where we would still give people the benefit or the power of being able to modify the source code themselves, put in their own models. Um, but again, like you said, take away 
the mesh generation time. I mean, people would be in, you know, getting their master's degrees or getting their PhDs and they would be spending the first couple of years or the first year just getting a grid that they could run. And that seemed uh, like something that needed to change. Like you said, the future wasn't there. So originally we were going to be, uh, you know, the code was called Moses. Of course, now it's called Converge, as as most of you probably know. But it was modifiable. Wait, we changed the name. It was modifiable source, but then it was uh, modified open source. So it was originally modular open source. Modular Engine open source. That's what that I was, was trying the original to remember. One, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So exactly. So we actually wrote um, an unsolicited SBIR grant to the Department of Energy, and they kind of said that looks like a good idea, but you know, no, <laughs> and but come back maybe when industry is interested in this code, because we do see that it could have a future uh, if industry is interested. And we went to industry. They were very interested, and we never really went back uh, to the DOE at the time. But, of course, we work very closely with the DOE now and have for the last 10 years or so. So that's kind of, yeah. So originally it was supposed to be an open source code. Along the way, we changed our mind on that. And what we decided to do was keep it a commercial code, but open up enough of the code through user-defined functions that users and students could still implement their own submodels and kind of the things that, you know, we don't have a CC flux, but kind of the analogous routines that we have, um, they don't really need to touch, but they would want to touch all the submodels. So we make that available to the users. And we have been successful in making it a useful research tool. So those same research groups that we're using Kiva, even though we're giving them a commercial replacement for Kiva, those same research groups are using Converge, and we're helping them so they can continue to write their own submodels, put yeah. them in Converge. So exactly. we did meet our goals. It just wasn't through an open source code, but we, we did get both production and research at engine companies are, are using Converge. It has the ease of use, and it has still the research aspect. And not only engine companies, but lots of other applications now as well, which is, which is very exciting um, to see that. So... Okay, so we started this company. We decided we were going to write a new code from scratch. So now that we knew we were going to do that, can you talk about how we got started and what were the first steps in creating that new code? Well, on the funding side, we, we did have one industry, uh, one industrial partner, I'll call them, that, that did see a future in, in having a better C engine CFD code, and that was Caterpillar. Uh, we'd done a lot of consulting work for Caterpillar, had a great relationship with them, and they they trusted us and we trusted them. And that was that was an important relationship for us. And they gave us a little bit of seed money for two years. They said, okay, here's a little bit of money for two years. Uh, we'll call it a feasibility study, see what you can do in two years. So we were originally going to do an immersed boundary method approach, which there were several papers out there that we'd seen that show the immersed boundary would be a, a suitable way to do a very easy setup of geometry and automated meshing. It would be a finite difference approach. Uh, the meshing would be easy. So Caterpillar said, here's some money for two years. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough for us to to get started. So if you remember, uh, Kelly, you were still doing some consulting on the side to help pay the bills while Eric yeah. and I dropped all consulting and just started writing the code. Yep. And it was it was actually very helpful that Caterpillar gave us that because it's it's hard to stay afloat when you don't have any of your own money uh, to pay the bills to have, uh, you know, have somebody that, that took an interest in it. Yeah. And so to start that, I mean, we started with a blank screen and we started. In fact, the first the first month we were just trying to decide what compiler to use. Uh, Eric was lob You and Eric were both lobbying for Fortran. And yeah, I was we both wanted Fortran, for, I remember. And I was lobbying for C. And we spent a month just writing different routines that weren't CFD code, but they were routines that would mimic the matrix operations that were done in CFD, right. uh, just looking at speed and efficiency, uh, looking at memory usage and trying to decide. You know, I was lobbying pretty hard for C, and the argument you guys were making was that Fortran was quite a bit faster than C. So what we were trying to prove is that we could still get the speed in C, but we could have the dynamic memory, uh, we could get the speed of Fortran, but have the dynamic memory capability that uh, was better in C than it was in Fortran. Right, right. Yeah, I remember those debates back in the day. And um, yeah, I didn't think you were going to win that, but you did. So, and the rest is history. Now, I guess we're, maybe we'll talk about this later, but now we're C++-based, 
right? With some of the some of the newer things we've added to the code, but maybe we'll get to that later in the in the episode. Okay, so you already talked about it a little bit just in picking the compiler, you know, C versus Fortran, we went with C. What are some of the other main considerations that we had to take into account when we were writing the code? Can you think of a few? Well, if if you're going to compete with a new code, you have to have something that's significantly better. Right. And you know, there's a there's a possibility that if you're already a big established company and you were creating a CFD code, but you already had a customer base from an adjacent product, then you wouldn't have to be special. We had to come up with something special. That was the only way we were going to get companies to even consider looking at us. And that was the, the automated mesh generation or the autonomous mesh generation. Mm-hmm. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Converge, when we talk about automatic or autonomous mesh generation, it is done at runtime by the solver. This isn't something that's done automatically as a pre-processing step. It's actually done during the solve. Uh, that allows you to have any sort of arbitrary motion, all sorts of mesh changes uh, with the automatic mesh refinement. Um, so that was going to be our, our step change in capability that was going to get us there. So to do that, we had to come up with a automated meshing technique. As I mentioned earlier, the original plan was to use an immersed boundary method, which is a finite difference approach. And so the original plan was, okay, we're going to go down this road with a finite difference approach. Uh, Actually didn't work out. uh, But one of the main decisions was finite difference versus finite volume when you ask some of the decisions that need to be made. Choose a compiler. We finite difference, finite volume. Started finite difference. In the end, ended up being finite volume. There were just too many, too many issues that we couldn't overcome in a commercial code with when using finite difference. And and the immersed boundary method, uh, while it worked well for for high resolution cases where you had a significant number of nodes, uh, it just didn't work when you had engineering type mesh resolutions. It just didn't work as well. Right. Okay, yeah, and I remember, I kind of remember, and I maybe I remember it more because we've talked about it over the years, but we kind of came to that conclusion and we, what, we threw away, what, a year and a half, year and a half's worth yeah, of code? We, yeah, we were 18 months in, uh, of yeah. the two years, the two years that Caterpillar gave us. And it's not, <laughs> it's, it's not like the world was coming to an end if we got to the two years and we didn't have something. Caterpillar wasn't expecting a return on this. It was a feasibility study. But for us, it kind of was the end of... Moses, as it was called at the time, if we couldn't come up with something that would work, we had to present something yeah. to Caterpillar to show feasibility. So we were 18 months in, and I still remember sitting at lunch uh, in that little lunchroom that we had there on D'Onofrio Drive. In the basement. In the basement. <laughs> and uh, we had been for about a month trying to overcome some of these issues with the immersed boundary method and the pressure solver, but the pressure solver just wasn't well specified. And I remember uh, during that one hour at lunch, we just decided it wasn't going to happen, that these issues were not insurmountable. And we left the lunchroom, went back and started over. Uh, Now, granted, we learned a lot in the process. So when I say starting over, yeah, we were going back and rewriting code from scratch and a lot of it. But, you know, we we'd gained a lot of experience at that point, but we were we were 18 months in on a two year project. We had six months to start over and make it happen. And and we did. And, you know, there were a lot of a lot of late nights and a lot of nights we didn't go home. Yeah, there was uh, about a month there where I felt like we didn't go home. So I'm not going to tell the viscosity story. Um, I've told that one (laughs) enough. I'm not going to embarrass you too much. But you do still owe me some time back on that. Um, But actually, you're giving some of it back to me by doing the podcast. So thanks. Okay, so we've already kind of hit on some of these now, but it's related question. But what were some of the other challenges and hurdles we faced while developing the code? Can you think of something that we haven't already touched on? Well, I would say uh, when you start from scratch, you, you, you have in your mind, this code is going to be perfect. You know, that it's yeah. going to be really accurate. It's going to be really fast and really easy to use. Well, you have to start making trade-offs. And some of those are accuracy versus stability. And I can't tell you how many times... We go to conferences and somebody comes up to you in the booth and tells you how your code isn't nearly as accurate as theirs and theirs is much more accurate. Okay, we had to make we had to make trade-offs and we had to make decisions along the way that uh, 
we need stability. We need stability for a commercial product. If somebody's going to use this in a production environment, it has to be stable. So you end up making those trade-offs. So that was one of the challenges that we had to overcome. I don't know if I'd say overcome, but we had to adjust to. Uh, I learned to appreciate other commercial codes better for their stability. Uh, let's, yeah. let's face it, a commercial product that gets used heavily has to be stable, and, and most companies do a good job with that. And so we had to make similar trade-offs to what some of those other codes had done. So that was, I would say that was one of the challenges that we had to come around to, to accepting. Yeah, I agree. And, and, you know, like you said, when you're writing something from scratch, you always kind of set out with this idea that everything is going to be perfect. And, you know, and not to get not to send the wrong message, Converge is pretty perfect, but but it's not perfect. Right. I mean, no code is perfect. And you're right. You have to make the stability accuracy trade off. So I remember even dealing that dealing with that, even like in the spray models, which I did a lot of and some of the sub models. So, um, yeah, definitely. Um so yeah, that isn't to are, say that it's, you're right, it's not yeah. to say it's not an accurate code, but yeah, right. if, if, if you want something that's going to be truly fourth order, I mean, to make something that's truly fourth order accurate, it's, it's just not going to happen in, in a commercial code with stability, with exactly. stability and speed. It's just not going to happen. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, make it as accurate as you can make it and still keep it stable. That's kind of, kind of the goal. So how long did it take us? I mean, in the end, to go from I know there were different phases of the of the code, different versions, um, and again, we eventually changed the name to Converge, as people know. But how long did it go from, say, the idea that we had to a fully realized code? Maybe like the first the first version that it could actually do something real. How long did it take? Well, first of all, side note: the reason why we switched the name. I don't know if everybody knows why we switched the name from Converge, but Moses was already taken for a CFD code. Yeah, so as, believe as it or cra- not. As crazy as that sounds, we thought, oh, we'll just keep it Moses anyway, but it was already taken. Yeah. Yeah, and I can't believe I I never got to use my tagline there, parting the red CFD. I mean, that would have been perfect, but... It, it oh would have well. been, that would have been good. <laughs> so from the time we started, it was about 2000 uh, when we yeah. first started writing the code, and it wasn't until 2008 that we had a product that we released and started to sell. Right. And, you know, when you talk about having a finished product, there's no such thing as a finished product in CFD. You know, there's, there's a product that's good enough that uh, we can get use out of it. And that was, that was 2008. when we finally had something that we could, we could say, yes, this is beneficial to, to the community and and we can start marketing and selling it. Yeah. We had a version before that as well, but it was more internal. We could do internal consulting with it, yep. but it wasn't something we felt really good about running it ourselves because we knew the ins and outs of the code, but we weren't quite ready to kind of release it to the world. It wasn't, you know what I mean? So yeah, 2008 definitely was when we, I remember going to the SAE conference in April and that's when Dan Lee first came back into the company and took over sales for us, which we desperately needed. And, you know, we were walking around from booth to booth. Dan had his little notebook writing everybody's contact information down. I thought, wow, are we, what's going to happen here? I mean, looking back, of course, it worked out really well. But, yeah, those were some good times. Okay. So, okay, so we've got this, we've got this code now. It's easy to use, autonomous meshing, adaptive mesh refinement. Beyond that, what do you think have been some of the most important improvements we've made to the code since it's been commercially available? Well, speed is is one of the big ones. And those of you familiar with version 3.0 know that we put a lot of effort in into making it significantly faster. But even early on after its release, uh, there were some things we did to to speed it up. One of the main things we did, and you probably remember this, Kelly, is we had version uh, 1.3.1, which was, we had two versions. We had the, the version that used linked lists for storage of the uh, primary cell variables. And it was really, really slow on uh, power architecture systems. It actually wasn't too bad on Intel architectures, but on the power systems, it was extremely slow. Right. And so we actually got folks from IBM to help us out and try and profile and figure out why the code was so much slower on their power architecture than it was on Intel and it was it was the linked lists. Uh, their memory access uh, was much more problematic, larger word size. So when we were when it was fetching information from RAM, it was pulling a lot more information. 
and the linked list was not doing a good job of having coherency in the memory. So we had a version that we made, 1.3.1, where we took all the intrinsic variables and put them in one-dimensional arrays. And that was 1.3.1 speed. And it was about a factor of five speed up on the power architecture. And on the Intel, it was almost a factor of two speed up. So so we've had in the legacy code since then, we had both the link list storage and the one-dimensional array storage up until version 3.0. It wasn't until 3.0 that we completely eliminated all the linked list storage and just went straight to one dimensional arrays. Uh, it was part of the part of the speed improvements in 3.0. So there, there were other, you know, other major improvements that have largely been customer driven. Uh, yeah. You'd meet with customers and they'd say, Hey, you guys have done a great job making all of these aspects of the setup easy. Help me out with this one piece. You know, I need the valve closing and the events to be handled more automatically. And so those of you who are familiar with the way we do valves now uh, don't know what it was like before. You know, we used to have uh, a much more complicated way of shutting off valves. Uh, but as customers told us, you know, you're, you're, you're 95% of the way there on the, automated, on the automatic setup. Give me the extra 5%. For them, they would tell us what that was. So, the, right. you know, the valves was part of that. There were s- several other customer-driven things that have changed. We've done a lot in combustion modeling and spray modeling. You know, when we first started, we had a very limited set of combustion models and spray models. Uh, some of that comes from development we've done. Some of it comes from our partners. You know, we, we've worked with a, a number of entities, Argon, um, IFPEN, uh, even working with Caterpillar. There, there's been a lot, of, a lot of collaboration that's been done in the spray and combustion modeling. Yeah, for sure. And, and that customer interaction has been critical because... You know, these are the people that are running the code day in and day out, you know, running probably a lot more cases than we run, and they know what they need, right? At the end of the day, they're our customers. We want to serve them the best we can. So getting feedback from customers to improve our code has been been incredible. Um, But what about 3.0? So talk a little bit about what the improvements are in 3.0. So 3.0 was – it was not a complete rewrite. This was not a blank screen rewrite. But of the, the core parts of the code, the, the grid handling, the automatic mesh generation, uh, that was pretty much a complete rewrite. Uh, most of that was, was necessary because of the link list, one-dimensional array duplicate storage that we still had from our legacy code that we needed to completely redo. We also needed to make it large-scale parallelizable. You know, the, the, right. the way we did the domain decomposition in version 1x and 2x the the way we did the domain decomposition worked well for you know 100 cores Uh, it just wasn't going to work well for a thousand or ten thousand cores so we really needed a better way to do the data storage do the domain decomposition if we were going to scale so 3.0 that was a big part of 3.0 was the rewrite of of the meshing and at the time since we were doing a rewrite we reevaluated what's the best compiler to use and that's when we opted to go with C++. Uh, I'm not going to say we're a pioneer there. Pretty much every other CFD code, when they'd done their rewrites, uh, had also done it in C++. There are a lot of, lot of intrinsic functions in C++ that make some of the, the core operations uh, easier to implement, more vectorizable. So, so we did the, the rewrite of the data structures and the meshing part. We did it in C++. Uh, also, we added the, the ability to do inlaid grids. You know that includes boundary layer meshes. That allows you to for the user to put some portions of the domain in a, a grid that they create themselves. So there are some that was also customer driven. A lot of demands yeah. for that to try and keep the cell count down uh, when you have boundary layer resolve flows. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So what's coming in the future? What what's in store for Converge? in future versions? So we're continuing to keep our engine customers happy. We get requests and some of that comes in the, in the form of spray and combustion models. Uh, we're still trying to get more and more accurate in the spray and combustion. And we have you know, a number of collaborations that are continuing with national labs and with, with other uh, industry partners for the spray and combustion. We're, the future of Converge though, and you know, if it, it, you hear very often that uh, if you're, if you're not progressing, then you're you're regressing. 
And progress for us isn't just in the engine market, but it's getting into other markets. Now, the, the capabilities that we have to do engines, the automated meshing, you know, the, the fluid structure interaction, all, all of these things that we have allow us to tackle a lot of hard problems, not just engine problems, but a lot of hard problems. Uh, yeah. Gas turbine gas turbines uh, are a complicated geometry. Uh, some aspects of them have moving geometries. It's something that we we do a really good job with. Uh, pumps and compressors, uh, biomedical. I mean, these are all things where CFD has been used, but simplifying assumptions have been made that remove some of the accuracy and some of the physics. Well, we can bring that accuracy and physics to the table with converge. You know, with the automated meshing and the ability to handle complicated moving geometries, we don't have to make some of those simplifying assumptions. So, but being able to tackle those other industries doesn't just mean bringing our meshing capability and the accuracy of our numerics. We have to add all the peripheral parts. So a lot of the effort that's going on at, at Convergent Science right now is let's find those pieces and parts for these other markets that's going to make them take advantage of our automated meshing and our complicated geometries and the accuracy of our numerics. They need the other pieces and we can put those in for them. And that's that's going to allow us to to continue to grow. And as I mentioned, we, we, we have, and, and you feel it, Kelly, as much as I do, we have a continuing desire to grow, grow, grow. That's, yeah. that's, uh, we want to maintain a strong hold on the markets that we currently have, but it's important to us that we, we continue to grow. Yeah, exactly. And we had a couple of really good examples of this on our last two episodes of the mesh up. Um, two episodes ago, I believe we had Alejandro, a professor from UW Madison who, yeah, when he, so he's been doing CFD for a little while with biomedical flows. And when he first was introduced to converge, he said, wow, this is what I've been waiting for. Right. Because I don't, I don't want to have to deal with making the mesh and I, and the way you guys do fluid structure interaction, it's just really natural with the meshing. And so that's one example. And then the last episode we had Roberto and Ihan from Argon talking about drone simulations. And again, like you said, that's a very hard problem, right? Uh, you know, rotating, moving boundaries, complicated geometries, complicated flows. And that's another area where Converge is really starting to shine. So, so definitely. So, okay, let's switch gears a little bit. And let's think about some of these people out there, maybe some students or, or younger people or older, whoever, somebody wanting to write their own CFD code, right? They have an idea for a new CFD code. Maybe they won't, maybe they have a different way to do meshing or they think they have a better numerical scheme or they just want to kind of duplicate what's out there just because they love CFD. But if they want to write a new CFD code, what advice would you have for them? So I would say if, if, when you're writing a CFD code, what, what's your purpose? Is this to learn, is this to learn numerics, to learn how a CFD code works? Because if that's the case, it's pretty easy to do. I mean, let's face it, anybody who's, who's taken the CFD class understands that it's not that hard to write a single purpose CFD code. It's the multi-purpose aspect of it that adds significant amount of complexity, not technical complexity, but bookkeeping complexity and just a lot of code. If, if you want to learn CFD, do flow in a box. Then you don't have to deal. You don't have to deal with writing anything associated with the grid. Do a finite difference flow in a box. And, and, and hold on, don't use MATLAB. Okay, yeah, because Mat MATLAB hides all the fun numerics from you. exactly. You're right. Exactly, that's my pet peeve. With okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I would say my advice would be if if you just want to learn how CFD works, do flow in a box, and uh, it's you know it's pretty easy to do, and you can play games with lots of different numerical schemes uh, from doing that. The step from going from a single purpose CFD code to a general purpose CFD code is orders of magnitude. Uh, the amount of yeah. effort that's required in trying to make something that handles a lot of applications and any geometry. So, you know, when we talk about us starting to write a CFD code, yeah, we had a functioning CFD code within a few weeks. You know, it was eight right. years until we had a general purpose code, but it's not that it was after eight years that we hit the st hit the go button and hey it works. No, we had a we had a CFD code working within a couple of weeks. And anybody right. that's taken a CFD class understands that on, on the basic level, uh, it's not that hard to write a, a single purpose CFD code. I would yeah, also remember, say remember I did the backward facing step in CFD class. You did the what did you well, do? I did a flow in a box. I did flow in a box. <laughs> yeah, that's why you always go to that example. <laughs> I did the backward facing step. So anyway. Yeah. 
<laughs> we won't tell the audience what Dave Schmidt called us. Those of us who did the flow in a box. <laughs> we definitely will not. Um, but yeah, that's another one of those inside jokes that lives on forever. Um, okay. So yeah, you've given a lot of really good information here, both on how we got started and wrote our code, some great advice. Now, kind of in the tradition of this show, Tiffany normally ends these shows on a lighter note, and I want to do the same thing here. So is there a fun fact about you that you can share with the audience that they may not know already? I don't know if it's a, call it a fun fact, but I actually, my happy place is uh, in my shop building something or fixing something. I mean, my, uh, my wife and I, we got a group that every Valentine's Day gets together and we play the newlywed game. And we, my wife and I have won every year except once, and that was on a technicality I'm not going to go into. But one of the okay. questions they had once was, uh, if you could go on a, a, a vacation anywhere in the world, where would it be? And this is the newlywed game is where you come up with the answer and your wife comes up with the answer. And, and we nailed that one. And the question was, where would I go? And it was in my shop. So, I was going to say, <laughs> I, can, I even know the answer to that. <laughs> yeah, so we got that right. So that, that for me is my happy place. I call it's a it's a building on my property and I call it rehab. And that's where I go when I, I need to feel like the world is okay and everything's better. I go to rehab and that's that's my rehab. It's your therapy, right? I mean, yeah, yeah that's... Yeah, and, and I've known you for many, many years, and I will say to the audience, too, Keith is one of those guys that, not to embarrass you, Keith, but you kind of know how to do everything. It's it's strange, or you know how to fix everything. Anything that comes up, you've experienced it before. So that, he's a good friend to have, just so you know, if you ever have a problem with something. Or if you ever need, I mean, you see the car in the background there, and that's, not that that's your car, but uh, that's hanging up in one of our conference rooms, but that really fits kind of the setting here. So that's really yeah, it, Keith. I, I, I would say, oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. so well, of, of the the owners, I'm probably the only one that would actually use starter fluid uh, to inflate a tire. Um, I yes. actually did that. Yes, I had to. I couldn't get the bead to seal on a tire in my shop. And I sat there for an hour watching YouTube videos of people who would actually inject starter fluid into the tire and light it to get the tire <laughs> to explode. And I. I actually did that. And I would say I'm probably one of the only owner. I'm probably the only owner that would actually you, do that. No, there's no probably <laughs> here. You are the only, only owner that would do that. Okay. Uh, hands down. So yeah, that sums it up really nicely. So great. So Keith, I really appreciate it. Thanks for doing this show. Uh, I think this is a great way to end season one. And that's really it for season one of The Mesh Up. I want to thank all of our listeners for coming back episode after episode. We've gotten a lot of really good feedback. I want to thank Tiffany for hosting, uh, Liz for doing a lot of the, the script writing, and Shelby for recording and doing some of the post-processing. Uh, thank you all for listening, and we will be back soon. We don't have the exact date yet, but we will be back soon for season two. So stay tuned. All right, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.